Hi everyone, this is Damien for the DevOps Lab and I'm joined today by Dylan Smith. Dylan, thanks for coming along. Thanks for having me. So we know each other uh, in a previous life as MVPs, which is kind of um, fitting because we're here at the MVP Summit this year. And for a short time as fellow Canadians. That's right, short time as fellow can Canadians. And then I moved back to where there's sun and sea and stuff. But I kept in touch. There's a group, uh, the Western Devs of, of Canadian developers, and we're, we're chatting a lot. A lot of them at the MVP Summit as well. Yep, most of us. Most of us. So we were both MVPs, and then we both joined Microsoft at roughly the same time, I think. Like one week apart, maybe. One week apart. So I'm on the Cloud Developer Advocate team, and you are on the DevOps CAT team, or the customer, what does CAT stand for? Customer Advisory Team. Customer Advisory Team, awesome. So you, you spend a lot of time with customers, uh, making sure that they're using things like the STS and good DevOps practices, you know, in a, in a great way, right? Yeah, I mean, I kind of think of ourselves as the customer-facing part of the BSDS product group. Yeah. So whenever, you know, kind of uh, big customers want help with their DevOps transformation, um, you know, they'll work with the product group, and if they need more time commitment, my team will, will come in and help them. Nice. So one of the things that we were talking about, and we've seen a bit of this at the summit so far, is uh, the idea of security in DevOps, or DevSecOps, as yep. most people call it. Very so trendy. Very trendy thing, uh, DevSecOps, uh, and Dev everything else ops as well. But what what we were talking about especially was the fact that when you have this good DevOps process and continuous integration, continuous delivery, continuous deployment out to production, you're constantly releasing smaller bits of, you know, of your code and smaller bits of application. And what do the security people do then? Because you can't just pass that through a security team that takes three weeks to do their work before yep. getting it out to production. It kind of defeats the CI CD purpose. So like what's the solution to that? How do you how do you build this in? Yeah, and it's becoming I'm mean, hearing more and more about it as I talk to customers. Mm. You know, when you had six month or three month release cycles, security team would come in at the end of the release cycle and review it and run their scanners and approve and certify that release. Yeah. Uh, now that DevOps is you know taken off and people are going on the DevOps journey, they're releasing every week, every day, every hour in some cases, mm -hmm. and uh, the security team can't just do the same reviews they did twice a year every day. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So the whole the, the model and the way that they engage with the dev teams has to change. And you don't want to forget it either. Like you, you can't just say, well, you know, we're releasing constantly. You know, maybe we'll do a review every six months and and you know have a look at what we've broken in that time. There's got to be stuff built into that process. Yeah, and I, and I view it similar. If you ever, I'm, I'm sure you know the term shift left. Yeah. Right. Often uh, talking about testing, shifting left your testing instead of at the release on every commit. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of the same thing with security. You kind of have to shift left instead of doing it. Um, per release, uh, you kind of do stuff per commit and you build up a security pipeline. Yep. And what I see happening is the people, the security team who would usually review and certify each release, um, now they're not looking at every release or every change, instead they care about the pipeline. Right. Right. And we're going to build security checks and security analyzers and, and all that stuff into the pipeline and the security team cares that it's in there, that it's working well, that they can audit and review it and they trust the pipeline now. Right. And this, this is the idea of shift left, where if you think about everything from the idea you know, right on the left-hand side all the way through to running in production and monitoring and stuff on the right-hand side, you want to shift this, these concerns as far left as possible. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And in the whole DevSecOps movement, there's a lot of great tools now. Right? Obviously, I'm a big VSTS fan. If yep. you go in the marketplace and search for security, there's um, dozens of static code analyzers, open source vulnerability scanners, um, OWASP testers, fuzz testers, yeah. uh, you can do a lot of stuff automated right in the pipeline. Yeah, awesome. What, so one of the other things, I, and I know uh, as Microsoft's kind of gone through its journey of moving to DevOps with this uh, one ES or one engineering system, yep. where basically the entire company now is running on VSTS, um, which is something like 120,000 engineers or something along those lines, or is it about 80,000 yeah, engineers? It's 80-ish 80, 80 thousand right now, yeah. which is pretty much everybody. Yeah. I don't so think it's, it's not going to go up much more now. Yeah, right. So everybody's on there, but they've still had to build security into this. I mean, these are very public facing sites. You know, we're talking about the Azure portal and all the Azure services. Yep. We're talking about VSTS, which is also hosted <laughs> on Azure. So Microsoft had to have build, built that kind of security thing into the DevOps pipeline, right? Yes. And I can, I can show you a few of the things that, that we do on the VSTS team at least. Yeah, that'd be awesome. So, so there's, there's a few things that we do, and I kind of think about it three big areas. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is our kind of our build and deploy pipeline, our code pipeline, yep. and all the automated scanners. And for that, there's something called the Microsoft Security Development Lifecycle. It's been around for a long time. You go to Microsoft.com SDL, 
and there's like 17 practices or something that uh, pretty much every team at Microsoft is expected to follow. Mm -hmm. And it says do things like threat modeling, do things like static analysis, do things like fuzz testing. Um, so we do that. Uh, we have a tool called CredScan. Right. In fact, I can show you one of our PR builds. Just going to look behind you for this one. Yeah, I'm not sure if Zoom's going to work here. Nope. Well, it seems to work on here. No. Well, anyways, on the top left, you can see <laughs> um, cred scan validation succeeded. So every pull request we send in, we run this cred scan tool. It checks it for secrets or passwords that shouldn't be in source control. Yep. And if it finds them, th that code doesn't get in. So this is the idea of having like API keys or username passwords <coughs> and things like that in source, which they shouldn't be in. They should be in some kind of secure Azure Key Vault, something like that. Absolutely, right? Yeah. So we, we use this to prevent it from getting in source. Yeah. And then, you know, there's, there's, there's other tools. Some of these we're in the process of adopting, but um, White Source is a great tool. This is one of my, my hobby projects. Mm -hmm. And you just toss a task in there, White Source Bolt, and when you run a build, yep. it's going to go and take a look at all your open source dependencies, the versions that you're using, tell you if you have any older versions that may have known vulnerabilities in there. Right. And if you look at a lot of the breaches in the news, like Equifax or or Yahoo, or Sony PlayStation Network, and all these, all these big newsworthy breaches, um, they were almost always breached uh, through vulnerabilities that have long since been patched. Right. right. So people are just relying on old versions of stuff that have known vulnerabilities that they haven't fixed. So you can build this scanning into your build. We got the cred scan stuff. There's all kinds of other tools available to bake into your pipeline. Right. So that, that's kind of this point of you know, making sure that before it actually gets out to production, it's passing some sanity checks and things like that. But there's more you can do once it hits production, right? You shouldn't just throw your hands <coughs> up and say, well, we've tested what we can test. Absolutely. So, so yeah. the second thing we do, we do, we do three things. We do our pipeline. Mm -hmm. We have a whole bunch of practices uh, around how we manage our production infrastructure. Yep. You know, we've got like 3,000 secrets and we segregate stuff. Probably won't have time to talk about that. But the, <laughs> the second thing and the coolest thing that we do is uh, red teaming. Right. So have you heard of red teaming? I have heard of red teaming, but it's probably worthwhile explaining it. Yep. Okay. So red teaming is... Um, that's a term that's been around a long time, from the military, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, for VSTS, we do it three to four times a year, yep. and we put together a red team. And a red team is basically a team of hackers, um, like legit hackers, yep. uh, that are paired up with like very senior product engineers that understand the VSTS code base, mm -hmm. and they try to hack into VSTS right. three to four times a year. Right. And, then, and, then, you know, and they use some pretty advanced stuff to do that, and then they report out to the dev team uh, if they were able to breach it, uh, how did they do it so we can improve our security. Wow. Okay. And they, you know, the, the, the bottom line is they, they almost always breach it. Right. Um, which is, is good and bad. I mean, obviously, we would love it if we could fend them off one of these times. <laughs> um, but if they don't breach it, we're not learning and we're not improving our security. Sure. And yeah. uh, so what I hope people watching this, the takeaway is not, gee, is VSTS is really insecure. We breach it all the time. But the takeaway should be that we care very deeply about security and we're investing um, you know, very elaborate efforts to, to improve our security. Right. So it's kind of this idea of, you know, attacking yourself first so that other people aren't finding stuff that you don't know about and aren't going to you know, find out about later on. Yeah, and I mean, really the best way to know if you're secure is to get you know, skilled people to try and break through your security. Right. And uh, you know, when we first started this, I think some people, especially Brian Harry, I've heard, was, was quite skeptical that this was going to be valuable. <laughs> right. And uh, now it's absolutely critical. And the first few times we did Red Teams, it was uh, a little embarrassing how easily they broke in. Simple things like scanning public file shares for password files. Right. Right. Um, but there are some few interesting stories. So they have a few rules of engagement. Um, they're allowed to do almost anything because real hackers are allowed to do anything. Yeah. So they can do social engineering. They can do phishing. Um, you know, they can they can do all kinds of cool stuff. There, right. there. Some of the rules are they can't target customer data. Okay. Um, so we have enough Microsoft data in VSTS. They just target our accounts. Sure. Yep. Um, they can't like deny a service VSTS and bring it down for the world. That that wouldn't be okay. <laughs> yep, gotcha. um, and, and and really, the only other rule is they can't use physical intimidation. So they can't come and beat you up until you tell them that your password. Right. <laughs> sounds like sounds like a legitimate vulnerability. But I'm, I'm not understand. sure. Are there three rules that's in there? Like, did that come up at some point? Yeah. No, that's, there's a story behind every rule. Yeah. Well, one would hope you get, that's a common sense thing, but sure. Oh, wow. OK, so um, this happens with VSTS every three months-ish, you yeah, said? Yeah, three to four times a year. Three In fact, the last report yeah. out was just like a week or two ago. OK. And, uh, and one thing, some things that we've uh, learned doing this, we've done doing it three or four years now. Mm -hmm. um, in the early days, it was, it was very easy, they, you know, embarrassingly easy for them to get in. Yeah. Uh, I think the second event, they just, they just scanned our, they have access to our source code, mm -hmm. which gives them advantage real hackers don't have. Uh, so they scanned it for SQL injection vulnerabilities. Uh, yep. We have patterns that aren't supposed to allow that, but they found one spot where they could do it. So they got in that way. But nowadays, yep. um, 
in order to get in, they have to string together like four or five exploits, get a little bit, fish your credentials, do something to uh, expand your access. Yeah. So it's getting really hard for them. Right. Um, you, you mentioned phishing as well, which is kind of interesting. Yeah. Um, so I think I've you were saying you had some examples. So one thing we've learned about phishing is um, the, uh, that I don't think we will ever be able to stop phishing. Right. Uh, we're educating our staff. We're getting better, but I don't. It's just so effective. Yeah. Uh, I just uh, we have to now. We, when we think about security, we think about how can we keep the system secure even if our developers are phished. Yeah. So just to clarify, this is phishing PH, which is trying to get somebody to do something that they're not supposed to do. You know, use their privileges or something to to beat the system. Right. Is that more or less it? Well, I mean, phishing is sending people deceptive looking emails to try to get them to click a link and log into something that they think is a real site right. so that you collect their credentials. Okay, cool. So I got two examples here that we <laughs> used. Um, and this, the, the second one was more effective than the first one. This is just, you know, it looks like somebody scanned a document. Uh, but, you know, that word document attachment has, you know, macros in there or something that collects, sure. collects your data. Yep. Uh, 524 people we sent it to, uh, you know, what, 20 ish percent opened it. Right. Uh, so then we sent out another one here, and this is cut off a little bit. Let's see if I can make this bigger. Good enough. Um, so we sent out this phishing email, and it looks like to, to Microsoft employees, VSDS developers actually. We wanted developers' credentials so we could use them to get into production or whatever. Sure, yep. 500 people, and it says, hey, you've been selected to be part of a new phone program. We're going to give you a free phone. Come sign up here. Uh, you know, almost half of the people clicked sign up. Uh, what's really funny, though, is not only did half the people come and sign up, um, we got more people that signed up that we didn't send the email to. So people not right. only got fished, they forwarded to their friends who then got fished. Oh, wow. Okay. So it's just incredibly successful. So even if this stuff happens, which clearly it's, it's something that you know, even the most educated developers are still maybe going you know, to get tricked by, by a well-constructed fish, the key is even if that does happen, making sure that the measures are in place to, so that you know, the attacker can't actually get access to what they what they're after. Yeah, and like you know, for example, developers shouldn't really have access to production, and mm -hmm. and there's a bunch of other practices we use to do like defense in depth. So even if you get access to this one thing that you shouldn't, uh, we try to make it harder for you to expand that access out into into other things. So kind of minimize a blast radius or something yeah. like that. Yeah. But to give you another example, something I never thought of before. Um, if, I f if you're a developer mm -hmm. and I fish your credentials, maybe you have zero access to production. You probably shouldn't if you're a developer. Yep. But maybe you have access to edit the build definition. Right. Right. And I never really thought about this, but securing your engineering systems is just as important as securing production. Because if you think about what the build definition, typical build definition, mm -hmm. downloads your source code, builds your code, you know, packages it, and put, puts it somewhere. Yep. So now I fish your credentials. I'm going to go edit the build definition. I'm going to edit it so it downloads the source code. Uh, makes a change to the source code, puts yep. a new master password in that only I know, packages it, signs it, publishes it. You got continuous deployment. That gets rolled out to production. Yeah. Now I got a master key to production because I compromised the ability to edit the build definition. Right. And so, like, step number one is being aware of these vulnerabilities, right? Which is where the red team comes in. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, they found so many vulnerabilities that we, you know, probably never would have thought of. Wow. And and the big, I think the bigger impact is. You know, that security development lifecycle, one of the things in there is you should do threat modeling on a regular basis and, mm -hmm. you know, reduce your attack surface and all those good practices. And, and, you know, you can tell people to do that all day long. And some of them will and some of them won't. Yes. Um, but the red team thing really, really changed our culture for how we think about security. Because yep. when we do these report outs three to four times a year, the whole dev team's invited and the red team shows off how they broke into the system this time. Right. And no developer wants their code to be up on that screen in that meeting. Yeah. Right. So yeah, a lot of incentive to make sure that you're, yeah. you're so following these practices. Yeah, yeah. Nothing changed like the motivation for developers to care about security and to do threat modeling and all this stuff than than the fear of being the red team report out. Yeah. Wow. So kind of the 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 outcome of all of this has been that VSTS and like, Azure does a similar thing, right? You were saying. Yeah. So we do red teams three to four times a year. Azure has a full time red team. Right. All the time. One hundred percent of the time that there They're are people involved. trying to break in break into Azure. Yeah. And I think, and I think there's, I mean, you know, if you run a big cloud service and you're not doing red teaming, you should. And I, I can pretty much guarantee you, if there's a big cloud service that doesn't do red team events, right. um, if you put together a skilled red team, they will be able to break it. Right. Like, I have no doubt in my mind. Wow. So the, yeah, the outcome of this is really just that the application that's running in production, you can trust it a bit more. It's kind of this, if, if something's wrong, you want to know about it as early as possible. Yeah, and if yeah. you look, I think I got another stat in here somewhere. Um, not that one. 
So when we do, these are, these are the stats when we do the red team report outs. Mm -hmm. um, the outcome of that is usually a bunch of work items. Things that we gotta do to fix the, the hole that they used to get in. Yeah. Things that we gotta do to fix similar holes new telemetry that we should collect. So if they get in through that hole, we can detect them getting in. Right. Yep. So there's always a bunch of outcomes from these work items. Uh, and this is the count of security work items over the three or so years that we've been doing this. 226, uh, 226 improvements to security that were discovered as a result of red teaming. Right. So it's, it's having a meaningful impact on, on how we improve security. Yeah, absolutely. That's, um, that's kind of a fascinating way of thinking about that whole DevOps life cycle as well, because you know, the fast deployments and so on, you need to care about this stuff and ways of doing that without impacting you know, the speed of deployment to production is, yep. is really important. Yeah, so there's you know, the, the pipeline stuff, mm -hmm. uh, building security into the pipeline, um, doing the red teaming to, to verify that your thing is actually secure and continuously improving it. Yep. And we got a whole bunch of practices around how we kind of architect and secure our production infrastructure. Yep. Um, you know, lots of security boundaries, different subscriptions, different key vaults to manage our secrets. Right. Uh, very very uh, granular permissions assigned to the accounts different deploy time accounts and runtime accounts. Right. Um, and uh, you know, we, use, um, uh, we use an internal tool, but it's the equivalent of Azure Security Center, right. Right, which our customers have access to. Yeah. And it basically monitors all our production infrastructure and gives us a dashboard to tell us if we, if we have uh, uh, network security group ports open or antivirus is not up to date or this OS is not up to date or you know, make sure that our production infrastructure is always staying up to date with security best practices. Wow. Thanks so much for showing us this. This is kind of a side of VSTS and Azure that people don't really think about, I guess, a lot of the time. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see you know, what we're doing internally to, to secure this stuff. Yeah. yeah. So thanks so much for coming in. And um, yeah, keep, stay tuned for uh, more DevOps Lab episodes uh, in the future. And thanks for joining us. All right, thank you.